Am I on here? Can you guys hear me out? There we go. Now I'm hot. I mean, the mic's hot. That's not exactly what I meant. I apologize for that. What a timely song. I have, we have our ladies trio. I, my, well, my ladies trio, our young ladies trio to stand up. You got to stand up. Stand up. They st stand up. These three young ladies in our church sing that song. Right, have a seat now. And now that I've completely embarrassed them. They were, when they came in, they heard, they, they, they heard them singing that song. And so I'm not going to tell them who I think was singing better because I have to drive back 11 hours with them. They do such a beautiful job of that song. I can't wait to hear it again when we get back. What a blessing this has been for myself as well as the group. We brought 11 young people with us from uh, Southwest Florida. And um, I know my heart goes out to uh, Pastor Clarence Sexton this morning, our pastor's brother, and just be in prayer for him this morning as, uh, as he's in surgery. And I know that kind of overshadows things for us, but I do want to ask you to, uh, to listen. This, uh, this message is for you. Each and every one of you in here, this message is for you. I am the principal of Mariner High School in Cape Coral, Florida. We have 1,600 students at Mariner High School. We've had upwards of 2,200 students. I was a teacher. Actually, I was a student there. Graduated from there, and it's not always easy to go back to the school that you graduated from. But uh, the Lord allowed me to do it. Was a teacher, was a head football coach, was an assistant principal for many years, and now I'm the principal going into my fourth year. Do be praying. When I went back to school, or when I went back to teach there, and the Lord gave me the burden for young people in that school, it started with a teenager. It started with a young person who was willing to work in a club to see lost souls get saved. Legally, I cannot, as a teacher or as a principal, go to a student and present to them the gospel. It's against the law. I can't do it. However, through the law, we have seen over thir close to 3,600 students come to know the Lord at our school. And so I want you to think about that this morning as, as, uh, as I speak. And uh, my superintendent has given me the opportunity to be able to leave my school for a little. Oh, you know what? That reminds me. Hold, hold on just a second. You guys don't mind. Now, listen, now she's allowed me to be here, so let, I'm going to take a selfie, all right? Now, all of you guys right here in front, you guys are going to be, I'm, I have to send this to her so she believes me, okay? All right, you guys ready? Oh, hold on, hold on. Here, here we go, guys. Come on. Come on, give me something. Yeah, that, okay, there we go. There we go. All right. All right, thank you. I appreciate that. Now I can send that to my superintendent and let her know that I was, at, I told her I was coming here. I don't think she believed me, so I let her know. I, Thing that uh, right from the start, since we showed up here at, uh, at Crown College and, and Temple Baptist, it, it's been a blessing. On Wednesday night, I picked up this, this brochure. It was a blessing up until about the time in which my oldest son looked at this picture on the front and said, Dad, you look awful. <laughs> I said, thank you, Christian. He's right here down in front, too. I said, thank you. I, I really appreciate that. And uh, my wife, my loving wife, leaned over to me and said, sweetheart, it's okay. She said, you look so much better in person. I said, I appreciate that. She's very godly. And then she pointed up to the platform and she said, besides, that guy's much shorter in person than he looks on his picture. Talking about Pastor Ray. And I, I, I haven't seen Pastor Ray in here, but Pastor Ray, if you, my wife is right down here. There he is, Pastor Ray. She, she's right down here. She's six foot tall. If you need to have conversation with her, try not to be intimidated with her after we get done. But, uh, but it, this has been a true. And I, I want everybody, all of our young people to take out their journal and write down the title of this morning's lesson, message. You know, I don't, I don't get nervous, Steph, getting in front of people until he called me a preacher. When he called me a preacher, I said, whoa, hold on. Now, let's, not, let's not get out of control. You know, a, a principal is okay. You know, a teacher is all right. But a, a preacher, that's a little out of control. The title of this morning's lesson is The. Now, I'm not fancy, you know, like The Blessing, like Pastor Ray said. It's just The, T-H-E. You guys can handle that, right? The. It's just one word. It's just the, T-H-E. You guys look confused. 
homeschoolers, I tell you. <laughs> How many do we have that are being homeschooled right now? Raise your hand. Be okay. Now, typically when I ask that question, they are the loudest group. Let me try this again. How many homeschoolers do we have? All right. All right. How many do we have that are going to private school? That was awful. That was a weak attempt at trying to keep up with the homeschoolers. How many public school young people do we have in here? They're the most obnoxious. <laughs> now, this word, the. Now, before we get started, listen, I want to encourage you to take notes. All right? I want to encourage you to take notes. I know Brother Scott Pauley has mentioned it the last two nights. This is very very, very important to take notes because the Lord can speak to you. In fact, if I stand up here and speak for the next 45 minutes, you will only remember about 5 to 8% of what I talk about. That's it, of important, relevant information. So honestly, if you don't take notes, I should be up here for four minutes and we're done. Some of you, I didn't hear any cheers, so I guess I'm okay so far. <laughs> However, all you have to do is write it down. Even if you don't ever look at it again, you'll remember 25 to 35 percent of what of the relevant information that you wrote down. I want to encourage you to take notes. Yesterday, I did a I did a message with the young men, and I was shocked to see the number of young people that were not taking notes. Guys, this is so important. It's so so important because those of you who have been called to preach, even if you haven't been called to preach, but you make a decision, write that decision down. Write it down so that you can come back and look at it again. So the title of this morning's lesson, The, and while, uh, after you write that down, turn in your Bibles to Romans 8.28, a very popular portion of scripture. Romans 8.28. This word, the, is the most common used word in the English language. It is written in your King James Version of the Bible 73,611 times. Now, if our Bible, the Bible that you have in your hand, the one that I have sitting up here on the podium, is written by the inspiration of God, then that means that our Lord has put this word, the, in the Bible 73,611 times. The, more than any other word. Now, I'm going to give you an English lesson. I'm a teacher, so I'm going to give you an English lesson. How many of you love English language arts? That is your favorite class. Raise your hand big and high. You are a liar. Now, hold on. Keep your hand up. It's okay. I can call you a liar in front of everybody else. Listen, there, okay, you can put your hand down. There is no way that English language art, it's not anybody's favorite. The Bible talks about you people who just had your hand up. Deceiving and being deceived. That has to be you. That has to be. Now, of course, I'm giving you a hard time. But English language, I'm going to give you a lesson. This word, the, this word, the, it is what is called a definite article. A definite article. You guys hanging with me for just a second? You guys are hanging with me, right? English lesson, okay? It's okay. I'll be done in a minute with my English lesson. Definite article. A definite, an article is something that introduces a noun, person, place, or thing. Now, an indefinite article is a or an. So when a or an comes out, the next word is any one of many. Any one of many, which means the means one. The, the next, or the, what's to follow, the noun that it's describing is one. For example, Dr. Clarence Sexton is a pastor. He's a pastor. He is one of many, many pastors. And those that know Clarence Sexton personally might take offense to me calling him a pastor. They would say, no, no, he's not a pastor. He is the pastor of Temple Baptist Church. Dr. Tom Sexton is my pastor. He is the pastor. It's one. Take John 1.1, 1, 1, for example. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Imagine this verse, and us putting definite articles in there instead of definite articles. In a beginning. What beginning? 
just any beginning. In a beginning. A beginning. A beginning of Pastor Ray's growth spurt. It was a short one. Any grow, of course, I'm giving, now, he opened it up for himself when he was talking about his height, by the way. That's, that's why I can give him a heart. Now, he's not preaching tonight, is he? Oh. All right, I didn't, I, I overlooked that before I started giving him a hard time. So, in a beginning, any beginning, any beginning, but that's not what this verse says. The ver- this verse says, in the beginning. It's one beginning. One word gets rid of evolution. One word. In the beginning, when the Lord created the heavens and the earth. One Lord, in the beginning, was a word, just any word, was a word. And a word was with God, just any other word now. And a word was God, well, now we've made any word God. That's not what this says. It says, in the beginning, it's one beginning, was the word, one word, capitalized because it's a name. And the word was with God, and the word was God. It's still one. It's capitalized. It's the Lord Jesus they're talking about. It's one. Genesis 2-4 tells us that these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Not just a God, not just any God, little g, big g, one Lord God. But we believe that that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. That's one. And they, and they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house, Acts 16, 31. One Lord Jesus Christ, one. There are 54 million school-aged children in the United States. Now, that's hard to grasp, 54 million. You could throw a number out there, but unless you really see how many people that is, that's hard to believe. 54 million school-aged children, and you are a teenager. You are one of many. Now through this message today, I want to change the way you think. If you're willing to do that, I'm going to help you. I want to change the way you think about who you are. Are you a teenager or are you the Christian teenager that has been called according to his purpose. We, I've had you turn to Romans 8.28. I want to read that verse. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now let's go ahead and pray before I get too far into this thing. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness to us, Lord. I thank you for this morning, Lord God, and I thank you so much for all of these young people that you, you brought into this meeting this morning. I ask you, Lord God, to, uh, to lay your hand out upon Pastor Sexton, Lord, and, and give the doctors wisdom and discernment, Lord God, as they're in surgery right now, Lord. But I ask you, Lord God, to help this message, Lord. Help me to be a conduit for you, Lord. May this message speak to the hearts of young people, Lord God, and may as they leave today, may they be changed and fully committed to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So Romans 8.28 says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, I'm going to give you three points about what God needs from you concerning the. But I want you to walk away from this message and apply the meaning, the meaning of this word the to every part of your life. Number one, number one. Now, you don't have to just write down the points that I give you. It's okay to write down other parts that the Lord talks to your heart, speaks to your heart about, too. Number one, the Lord needs you to be the Christian, not just a Christian. That's number one. To be the Christian, not just a Christian. Mark 16, 15 tells us, and he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. When he said ye, he called us out as the Christian. As the Christians, he said, you go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. As a high school sophomore, as a young man, as a cocky football player, can I say that word cocky? Is that okay? All right. If I I can't, I'm already in trouble. 
as a cocky young man, there, uh, there was a gentleman, a young man named Jonah Sorrentino, who in the back of a math class loved me enough to share the gospel with me. And I came to know the Lord in the back of a math class. Now, I failed that math class because apparently I was talking about everything other than, than math. But that young man had enough in himself to know that I needed something. I had everything to live with and nothing to live for. I was miserable. I filled my life with everything that this world had to offer. Miserable. But he had enough in him to say, I need to, I, I, I need to step out of my comfort zone. He tells me the story. He tells me the story today that he was so nervous to talk to me about the Lord that this is what he said. He said, are you going to get saved or what? That's what he said. And then he just sat there and stared at me. And he said that my countenance just changed. And I said, yeah. I said, I need it. I need what you're talking about. I need what you are living. I need it. And I prayed in the back of that math class and came to know the Lord. Now, do you believe that Jonah Sorrentino was just a friend? Do you think he was just a Christian to me? No, he was the Christian. He was the young man that stepped out and, and presented the gospel to me. Now, I believe that everyone in this room, not everyone, I wish they did. I believe that most everyone in this room knows the Lord as their personal Savior. You know, from the time you woke up this morning till the time you go to bed tonight, you will make 35,000 decisions, approximately. Right now, you're making decisions, how you're going to hold yourself, how you're, whether you're paying attention, whether you're actually going to listen to me and take notes. 35,000 decisions. You make a decision, one of many decisions right now. If you haven't accepted the Lord as your personal Savior, that is the decision. That is the single most important decision that you will ever make in your life. If you haven't accepted Christ, it's time to stop living with the pain. Stop living a lie and accept Christ as your personal Savior. Make the decision today. Jonah Sorrentino was the man, the friend, the Christian who led me to the Lord, and he'll always be that. He'll always be that. Now, unfortunately, we live in a society that has many Christian teenagers who live like a teenager instead of the Christian teenager. To make this transition, you have to do one thing. I want you to write this down. To make this transition from being a teenager or even a Christian teenager to being the teenager, you must take responsibility for lost souls. You must take responsibility for your family. If they don't know Christ as your pers their personal Savior, you must take responsibility. You can't force it, obviously. Now, it doesn't matter if you're homeschooled. It doesn't matter if you're virtual schooled, public schooled, private schooled, your mama schooled. It doesn't matter what school you are. There are people that you are going to come in contact with every day that's your responsibility. It's your responsibility to make that transition from being the to from being a teenager or to the Christian teenager. But you have to take that responsibility for the people that you come in contact. Now this generation of Christian teenagers lives by this model. And this may be you. If this is you, I want you to change it today. They live by this motto. Someone else will tell him or her about the Lord. Another Christian will tell him. Somebody else. Another person. And honestly, Brother Scott, I believe that's the reason why our country is in the, in the peril that it's in. Because we live in a bubble. We live in a bubble, and we need to get out of that bubble. We must take responsibility for those that we come in contact with. Number two. Number two, to be the type of Christian person that God needs you to be, to be the Christian, number two, you need to be the success, not 
a success. Be the success, not a success. As a principal, I have times in which I have to meet with parents. A lot of times in which I have to meet with parents. I meet with parents every week. There are many times in which I meet with a parent who is weeping over their child. Weeping because of the decision that their child has made. A law that their child has broken and now they're in DJJ or worse off, they're going to jail. Or they're getting thrown out of school for a decision that they've made. An awful decision. And those parents weep. And I hear parents say so often, while they're weeping, I just want my child to be a success. I just want my child to be successful. I want them to be a success. And I say to that parent, your child is a success. And they look at me like I have three heads growing out of my neck. And they say, what? Stop, in the middle of weeping. What? How can you say that my child is a success? They're on their way to jail. And I say this, your child has successfully broken the law. Your child is a success at making poor decisions. Everyone in this room, every teenager in this room, I want you to look at me now. Every teenager in this room, you will be a success at something. Every one of you will be a success. Every one of you. Some of you are a success now. You're a success at Halo or Call of Duty or Fallout or Starcraft or Mario Kart. I like Mario Kart. <laughs> or Clash of Clans or Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or texting or whatever technological thing is out there now. Some of you are experts. You are success. Maybe, you're, maybe it's all those things. You are a success at those worldly things. My fear for everyone in this room is that you will become a success at that which does not matter. You'll be a success at this worldly thing, at these worldly things. Those things I just listed, unless they're truly used for the Lord, they don't matter. They truly don't matter. I want you to hold your place in Romans 8.28 and turn to Mark chapter 4. I find it interesting, and this isn't by coincidence, that Brother Scott Pauley, during his prayer, was talking about falling on good ground. And here we are, turning to Mark chapter 4 and verse number 4 to talk about the parable of the sower. I want you to think about this parable of the sower. The most important part of this parable for you to grab a hold of is the dirt, the ground. In order for a plant to grow, it gets its nourishment from the ground. And as you, I read through this, I want you to think about what kind of ground you are. Because what kind of ground you are is dependent on what you are a success in. Let's read this. Mark chapter 4 and verse number 4 is where we're going to start. And it came to pass, Mark chapter 4, verse number 4. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth. And immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched. And, it had no, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked it. And it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground. And did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some 30, some 60, and some 100. Now this parable is talking to you. The ground that it's referring to is you. Christians are ground. You're ground. And what type of ground you are depends on what type of success you are. Are you a success in the world? Are you the success that the Lord needs you to be? The wayside is a type of ground. The wayside. Some just fell by the wayside. They never even got rooted. These are Christians that live such a worldly life that nobody will ever get saved because of them. They're such a worldly success. They're so wrapped up in the things of this world. Most people wouldn't even think they're a Christian. Are you the wayside? Are you that type of worldly success 
where you look like the world, you dress like the world, you talk like the world, you act like the world. And those people that come around you are the seeds that will never know Christ as their personal Savior. That second type of ground is stony ground. You know what stony ground does? Stony ground covers the good ground. It covers the good ground. These are Christians. I want you to think about if this is you as a Christian. Don't think about other people. This isn't about other people. This is about you. One of the young ladies asked me what I was preaching about before I got started. I said, I'm preaching about you. And it's true. I'm preaching about you. Are you stony ground? Stony ground are these worldly Christians that are so wrapped up in being successes in the world that other people like them. But their parents say, you're going to church Sunday morning, you're going to church Sunday night, you're going to church Wednesday night. They say, okay, if I'm going to church, I'm going to grab my worldly friends and we're coming to church. I'm bringing my worldly friends from school and we're coming to church. And those worldly friends come to church and they get under the gospel and they spring up and they get saved. They accept Christ as their personal savior. And then as soon as they leave that church, that ground takes effect. That worldly ground and there's no growth. They get saved in church, they walk out of church, and that's it. That's it. Then the thorns. The thorns is the third type of ground. I don't, the thorns isn't really a type of ground. Actually, what's under the thorns is a type of ground. If you think about thorns, thorns actually need good ground to grow. So the thorns have good ground. These are those Christian young people who have a look about them of being a Christian. They're Christians. They know Christ is their personal Savior. They come dressed appropriately. They come to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. But it's somewhere in their life, they draw the line. They say, I'm not going any further. I'm not going to give up my worldly music. I'm not going to give up the video games, those violent video games of killing and blood sucking and all that other stuff. I'm not going to give up the things of this world. I'm drawing the line. And the people that are around you are the seeds. And you're the ground. And those worldly things choke out the ability for them to be able to grow. Choke it out. You've drawn the line. You're done. Then the good ground. Brother Scott, I want so much for every young person in here to be good ground. I want it so much. Your youth worker wants it, wants it so much. Your youth pastor wants it so much. But do you really want to be good ground? Do you want to be the ground do you want to be the success in what matters most? That good ground. That good ground where people come to you and say, will you pray for me? Will you pray for me? Can we pray? Can we get together right now and pray? Can we pray for our pastor? Can we help this person who's wayward? Let's do this. That's good ground. Being a success in that which matters most. Philippians 1 verse 12 will tell us what the success looks like. Here it is. This is what matters most. But I would ye understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out unto the furtherance of the gospel. What is the success that God wants every person in this room to be? He wants you to be a success in the furtherance of the gospel. He wants you to further his kingdom. That is the success. It requires some things. It requires you to get in your, in your Bible and read it. It requires you to pray. It requires you to be in church. It requires you to tithe. It requires you to step out of your comfort zone and tell other people about the Lord. It's the furtherance of the gospel. That is the success. Now listen, the Lord wants you to be the Christian. Not a Christian, the Christian. But the Lord wants you to be the success in that which matters most. The furtherance of the gospel. Hey, while you're here, while you're here, the Lord's going to speak to you. The Lord's going to speak to you while you're here. 
let me take a time out for just a second. If the Lord hasn't spoke to you, one of two things is happening. A, you're not listening. Or B, you don't want the Lord. This is the perfect place. It's the perfect setting. You're away from home. You're here. You're with other Christians. But I pray that the Lord seal that decision that you make. I pray that you write down that decision, that you revisit. Listen, it's, it's fine here. The most difficult part of the decisions that you have made is yet to come. You're going to leave here, and you're going to go back home. You're going to go to this, back to the same distractions that you had before you got here. You may even go back to a worldly home. You may even have to overcome parents. They may be Christian parents, but those Christian parents may have drawn the line too. My fear for you is that when you leave here and you've made these decisions, that you go backwards. Pray and ask the Lord to seal those decisions. It's easy here. It's so easy. What a powerful message we heard from Brother Scott Pauley last night. Powerful message. A prayer meeting. Wow. I heard our, our kids, we brought 11 kids, I heard our kids just excited about prayer meetings. Being the blessing from Pastor Ray. Wow. The joy pump. I thought that was a little weird when I first heard it, but it makes sense to me. What powerful messages we've heard. Don't let it go by. Listen, whenever I sit down to have conversation with my pastor, Pastor Tom Sexton, I tell this to my wife all the time. Whenever I sit down to have conversation with him, I have to have a pen and piece of paper. Because if not, I will forget some of the stuff that this wise man tells me. That's why it's so important for you to write it down. That's why it's so important for you to put it down here. But don't just put it, da put it down here, close it when you get home, put it up on the shelf. Look at it. Open it up. Revisit it. Go back. You know the feeling that you have when you made that, uh, that decision, that excitement, that joy, that enthusiasm? Go back and relive it so you don't lose it. The Lord wants you to be the success in what matters most. Number three. Number three. Our Lord needs you to be the difference, not a difference. The difference, not a difference. Jude 22, which is this Congress's verse, says, and some having compassion making a difference. Now, this is talking about an entire group, some of this group, this entire group. There are some in the group that are going to move forward with one purpose, the furtherance of the gospel. They make the difference. Listen, our society wants, people, wants young people to make, to make a difference. They get excited about when young people make a difference. They get excited about when young people make a difference about different things, about, um, about what's the, you know, coming up with the newest technological marvel, what's neat, what's new, what's all of these things. I'm going to make a difference in this world by inventing something, by coming up with something. By coming up with that next technological thing that people wait hours in line to come to, to purchase. The Lord wants you to make the difference. It's specific. It's pointed. The Lord has a plan and purpose for your life. It's the called according to his purpose. Listen, young people, look at me for just a second. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. If I bored you to death, please don't tell me. I'm very sensitive. That's how I became a high school principal. Everyone in this room has something that the Lord wants you to do. Only you can do it. The person sitting next to you cannot do what the Lord has for you to do. The difference that the Lord has for you to do, only you can do it. That's it. If you choose not to do it, man, what a shame. Now, this isn't common. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something, but uh, I'm going to ask for uh, some people to do something for me. But they gave me the microphone, so I guess I can get away with it. 
I'm going to ask for every adult in the room to stand up. Every adult in the room, please stand up. Young people, I want you to look around. I want you to look around at every, young, every adult in the room. Look around. Look around. Some of you are still looking at me. I'm not, not me as an adult. Look around. Look around at these other adults. That's, that's a lot of adults. That's over, what do you think, over 100 probably? There are over 100 adults in here. Keith, now just do me a favor and be standing for just a second, adults. Now, young people, I want you to think about this. Every adult in this room can spend every waking hour for the rest of their life seeking young people, seeking the seeking teenagers lost souls those teenagers who do not know christ as their personal savior this entire group of adults can spend the rest of their life every waking hour and then we could collect all of the young people who would come to know the lord during the, the their their life and combine them all and it would fail in comparison to one teenager in this room who gets thoroughly right with God and goes and tells other young people how to know the Lord. One, the Christian teenager who has decided to be the success in what matters most, to make the difference in this nation. It is not too late for our country. You guys can be seated. Thank you. It is not too late but it only takes one, one teenager. Every revival that I've ever read about, that I've ever heard about, has started with a teenager. Every one started with a young person. This word, the, the most common used word in the English language, it's everywhere in writing. It just fits right in. It's not even noticed. You don't even text it. You leave it out. We don't even notice it. Kind of like Christian teenagers. We just fit right in. Amanda, can you do me a favor and stand up? This is one. It's one of my young ladies right here, Amanda. This is one. I've put the emphasis on one teenager. One. She's standing up. As I look out across, I've got everybody else sitting down. I've got one. Almost everybody in this room can see her right now because she stands out. She made a, she made a decision yesterday on the altar. Is that correct, Amanda? You made a decision yesterday on the altar? She made a decision to start a prayer group, to start a prayer meeting. That's one. That's one. That's one teenager. You think about all the hundreds of adults that I just ha had standing up. If this one young lady gets thoroughly right with the Lord, this nation's different. Our country's different. Her home is different. Our church is different. But who's going to join her? Who's going to decide to be the teenager that stands up for the Lord. Who's next? Who's next? Who's going to stand up with her? I'm asking you. Who, that's okay. You stand up. If you stand up, you stay up. Who's next? Who's going to... Hold on just a second now. Don't... No, you can stand up. If you stood up, don't sit back down. Don't stand up unless you're serious. Don't stand up unless you are ready to be thoroughly right with the Lord. Unless you are ready to be the Christian. To be the success in what matters most. That's okay. If you want to stand up, stand up. But don't stand up unless you're ready. Because you are making a commitment before your youth pastor, before your pastor, before your Lord to make the difference in this country. Who else? Who else wants to make the difference? Who else is going to stand? Don't stand unless you're ready. It is the difference that we need. I, stood, I sat there and watched. Keep standing. I sat there and watched those young ladies as part of that uh, football team, that, those cheerleaders. They were the ones that did it. 
Why couldn't the law touch them? Because they're the teenagers. They're the students. They're the children. The law protects them in a public school to go out and to tell others about the Lord. I couldn't do it. 3,600 young people that came to know the Lord at Mariner High School didn't have anything to do with me. It had to do, well, some. But there was a teenager who I grabbed at the beginning of the year who came to me and said, this is what I want to do. 3,600 teenagers later who have accepted Christ as their personal Savior, we need somebody else. We need you to be the Christian teenager. We need you to be the success in what matters most. We need you to make the difference. This country is going in a direction that can be stopped. Can. But it's going to take you. It's going to take each and every one of you. Those of you who are standing, praise the Lord. Those of you who are standing, praise God. Brother Scott, isn't that amazing? I tell you, wow. And we'll pray for each and every one of you. I don't want you sitting down until we finish this. I don't want you to, pr- I don't want you to sit down until, you fin- until we're finished. But this word, the, is such a common word. It's the most common word used in the English language. I want it to change your life. If it's the most common word in the English language, that means you're going to use it more than any other word. I challenge you every time you write it, every time you look at it, every time you speak it, be reflectant of the decision that you make today. Let it reflect the fact that you're standing. You are making a stand for God. You're making a stand for this nation. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you so much, Lord. I thank you for these young people who are willing to stand. And, Lord, we need so many more. It'll only take one, though, Lord God, that gets thoroughly right with, the, with you. I ask you, Lord God, to lay your hand down upon this decision that has been made. Bind this decision. Help them to seal this decision. Keep this decision, Lord God, to live a life for you. To lay aside the weights and sins that can hinder their walk with you. Help them, Lord God, in everything that they do. In Jesus' name, with head bowed and eyes closed, I'll pass the microphone off to to Brother Scott.